transmission. For example, if the recording is disrupting the conduct of the meeting or is being undertaken in a manner which could capture personal information or in the event that a member of the public participating in a meeting objects to being recorded. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm now going to ask all members to introduce themselves. I'll start with myself. I'm Dennis Chapman. I'm a councillor for Mosborough Ward. Uh, Councillor Alan Woodcock, councillor for East Ecclesley Ward. <coughs> councillor Tony Downing, councillor for Mosborough Ward. Peter Price, member for Shea Green Brightside. Councillor Ibu, uh, councillor for Netherridge and Sharon. Mike Chaplin, councillor for Saudi Ward. Laura Moynihan, councillor for Manor Castle Ward. Good afternoon, all. Councillor Gallagher, they're all for Shea Green and Brightside Ward. Councillor Henry Nottage, Councillor for Hillsborough and Timekeeping. Uh, Roger Davison, Member for Ecclesall Ward. Barbara Masters, Member for Ecclesall Ward. Yep. Uh, Richard Williams, Member for Stellington Ward and substitute for Councillor Tiff Woodcroft. Thank you, Councillors. Right, shall we move on now? Apologies for absence, Abby. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've had apologies for absence from Councillor Bernard Little and his sub is Councillor Henry Nottage and apologies from Councillor Cliff Woodcraft and his sub is Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you. Item three, exclusions for the public and press. There are no items to be excluded today. Do we have any declarations of interest from any members? Councillor Moynihan. Hello, um, I'm acquainted with one of the objectors, but it doesn't affect my ability to make any decision. To name the objector. Oh, sorry, me. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't know, because I don't know. We, our sons went to, to school together, so I don't know what he's here to object to. I've just been informed by Vic, um, Victoria. Okay, fine. <laughs> I'll get it. Thanks. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I um, will declare an interest on the application 23 stroke 02023 um, Mill Plain Junior School as a ward councillor. I've had various representations, had many conversations, not anticipating actually sitting on this committee for this one, but circumstances have got against me, so I feel it would be inappropriate for me to be involved in the discussion. Thank you, Councillor. Right, so we move on to the minutes of previous meetings. As there was no meeting in December, the previous minutes are for the meeting held on 7th of November 23. Which is from page 9 to page 13 of the minutes. We all take them as true and correct. Thank you. Right. Item six on the agenda is the next site visit, which will be on Monday the 5th of February. Now we do have four applications to hear from today and we've altered the agenda a little and the first item we'll be taking will be item 7b this is 23 stroke 02023 at Nook Lane Junior School Nook Lane Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so the site is uh, Nook Lane Junior School, which is located in the Stannington area of North West Sheffield. Nook Lane Junior School is located very centrally to the catchment area that it serves, being bordered by residential properties on all four sides of the site. Collectively, many of the properties are known as the Acorn Estate. Many of the streets are connected with the school via a, a network of public footpaths, including one which runs alongside the eastern boundary of the site. 
access is directly from Nook Lane, which is a cul-de-sac that ends at the school site entrance. The school grounds themselves consist of a mixture of school buildings, a small car park, a hard surface yard area for outdoor play, and a grass playing field. There's a considerable amount of vegetation located within the school site that mainly consists of hedges on the northern, southern, and western boundaries. There are, however, some larger trees that separate the school buildings from the playing fields either side of a small water course that passes through the site and adjacent to the western boundary. Uh, this is an existing site layout plan which shows the boundary treatments which are currently in existence on the site. There is already a 2.4 metre high green well mesh fence of the type proposed in existence at the Nook Lane frontage and on the eastern boundary adjacent to the public footpath that links Nook Lane with the Acorn Housing Estate. However, in the locations of the perimeter, the formal boundary treatments are less consistent, being a mixture of timber fences and hedges, making them less secure. In some locations, the timber fences are broken and in a state of disrepair, and there are gaps in some of the hedgerows. The proposal is to carry out works to install a 2.4 metre high green well mesh fence of the same type as that in existence at the main entrance to the school around the remainder of the perimeter. The supporting documents explain that the proposal is intended to increase the safeguarding provision for the pupils at the school site that in recent years have been breached by members of the public using it for dog walking, fly tipping and recreational activities both during and after school hours. Unauthorised trespass and dogs being let off leads and dog fouling have been identified as the main hazards which the proposal is seeking to address. Here is a visual of the proposed fence type. It would be of the powder coated wire mesh variety. It would be 2.4 metres high. That compares with 2 metres being the permitted development height threshold, making the proposal only 40 centimetres higher above what could be installed without the need for planning permission. Uh, this is a visual of the existing 2.4 metre high Greenwell mesh fence already in situ at the site entrance. The proposal is just to replicate that around the rest of the perimeter. Uh, the application has been subject to 15 objections from members of the public. In summary, the main concerns include loss of outlook and overbearance, loss of privacy, concerns about the impact on wildlife and vegetation, non-material planning considerations have been raised, including the ability of residents to maintain their boundaries, concerns that access to an existing culvert would be impacted, and concerns about the cost. In addition, the application is supported by the police and an up-to-date figure of two local residents for child safeguarding reasons, which they view should be the priority. The comments within the representations also express concerns about the trespass activities within the school at the present time, including the reports about dog walking and fouling. And there's also support for the fence choice which has been selected. The committee report explains the assessment of the proposal that's been carried out by officers. The main considerations relate to the impacts on visual and residential amenity the potential impact on the existing vegetation adjacent to the site boundaries. As has already been explained, this is a tap fence that is already in existence on some of the school boundaries, and so it would not be out of character. Its green powder coated white mesh type compares favourably with solid fences or the more oppressive palisade fence type. It would also allow a reasonable level of visibility through it. Also, the green colour coating as opposed to exposed bare metal would blend in well with the vegetation that it would sit next to. Consider that the modest 40 centimetre height difference compared to what could be built and the permitted development rights would not be materially harmful to residential and visual amenity. Residents' concerns about the potential impacts on the existing vegetation have been investigated with the applicants. The school intends to install the, uh, the fence on the school side of the hedge, 
but as close to it as possible to avoid creating a no man's land situation, which was highlighted by the police as something to avoid. They do not intend to remove any vegetation. The council's landscaping officer being consulted has not objected for two reasons. One, they consider the proposal is justified in relation to health and safety of children. Secondly, further information has been provided in the form of cross-section plans which show that how the fence was positioned on the school side of the fence. This is an example of what the uh, cross-sections in the northwest corner, G to G and H to H, which is on the slides at the moment. As a further measure, it is proposed to impose a condition requiring a submission of arbicultural documents, include a method statement and protection measures prior to where it's commencing. Subject to this condition being adhered to, the proposal is considered acceptable and is recommended for approval accordingly. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Right. Do we have any members' questions? No speakers. There are no speakers on this, no. Any members' questions? Right, Councillor Chapman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm particularly concerned about um, two of the, the nature of two of the objections that have been raised. One is from some residents, or one or more residents, um, who are concerned that they would not be able to maintain their existing boundary um, up against the school, <coughs> the school's boundary. And the other one is about the, the existing access to a culvert that, um, that floods I presume periodically, and that access to that would not be um, <coughs> would be prevented by putting fencing there across it. Is there any way round round that? Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I mean, I think we're probably straying onto um, considerations that wouldn't be regarded as being material to the planning process. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the boundaries are the boundaries. So, what's um, is the school's land? It's their responsibility um, to maintain. And um, from in the discussions that I've had with the school, um, I know that they regularly inspect um, the culvert and then clear out any any blockages. So, I was reassured that that shouldn't be an issue. Um, Again, from my discussions with the school, I think some residents perceive the, the culvert um, getting blocked as, as what's responsible for a lot of just the conventional land drainage problems, just what you have with uh, the site being on a bit of a hillside and what run off just down from the bottom of the hill down towards the bottom of the playing field area where it just pulls. Um, but that isn't as a result of the culvert overflowing. Um, that's a, a, a separate thing. Okay. Any more questions? Any comments? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's imperative that we make sure that children are safeguarded when they're, when they're in the school grounds and that people cannot get into the school, while, especially while they're there. The other thing is we all know the dangers of dog excrement and, 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 and the, the causes of liver complaints, blindness, and things like that. And if people persist in letting their dogs go on school, school grounds, then we're always going to have this danger uh, 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 there. So I would certainly recommend that we uh, go with the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Officer Chapman. Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you, Tony, for, for saying pretty much what, uh, what I, I would say. I think in, the, in these circumstances, I, I believe that child safeguarding um, trumps other considerations um, and that there aren't sufficient material <coughs> reasons for, for challenging uh, the officer's recommendation. So I fully support the officer recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Davison, did you want to say something? I mean, the only reason this has come to the committee is because it's a, it's a bit higher uh, than uh, uh, would otherwise uh, uh, be, so that they could have had 
uh, th th this fencing without uh, planning permission. Um, people don't spend money, schools don't spend money uh, without there being a reason. Uh, these fences are very expensive to, uh, to, to, to uh, build and, uh, and maintain. So I would say that uh, uh, apart from the safeguarding issues which uh, has been brought to mind and it's, you know, we all feel that it's, um, it's a pity that we have to um, go down this line nowadays, but uh, it, it is essential. Um, apart from that, uh, all, all the uh, other things, you know, like people dumping stuff in the school grounds is, uh, is pretty appalling. So um, I can't see any reason. Oh, and the culvert. Well, most of that culvert's open, isn't it? Uh, so uh, th there wouldn't be a, a problem as far as I can see. So I will uh, certainly support the uh, recommendation. Councillor Price. Yes, sure. thank you. Yes, children's safety must always be paramount. And uh, I'm surprised it took so long, actually. But if children do play on that field, the fence of this nature hasn't been put in previously. Because all the schools I'm involved with have got similar fencing, in fact, identical fencing. And the fact you can see through it seems to me to clear all the fears people had of blocking out light, etc. So I'm, I've no, no problems at all by supporting this recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Masters. Yeah, the thing that struck me yesterday when we went to visit the site was um, the concerns over public liability, because it is an open site. It is attracted to out-of-school use by other people in the area, not just for dog walkers, but as a play area. And I quite accept the fact that schools do have an issue trying to make things safe in the public in this current litigious age. So I've got no problems in sort of supporting the recommendation on all the grounds mentioned and this additional one as well. Thank you, Councillor Masters. Anyone else? Okay, shall we take a vote on this then, please? Councillor Woodcock. For the officer recommendation, Chair. For the officer recommendation, Chair. For 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 Chair. Thank you, everyone. Right, shall we now move on to item 7A? Right, planning application 23 oblique. Sorry, we need to go to questions. Yeah, we realise we're not going to have to go to them. All right. Planning application 23023023, Nook Lane Junior School, Nook Lane, sh no, not that one, we've done that one, sorry about that, 7A, 23 oblique 02734, land at the junction of Scarsdale Road, Derbyshire Lane, land opposite 105 cross size 145 Derbyshire Lane. <coughs> the officer presenting. Thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, so this is an application for seven dwellings uh, with associated property and landscaping. Uh, the site uh, is on, on the screen now, uh, which you can see is a very unusually shaped site, um, very narrow uh, and long, um, and also there's a significant fall from uh, south to north uh, across the site. Um, the, that, that distance is approximately 225 metres uh, to give some kind of uh, idea of, of its size. Uh, the large properties to the left, which front onto Chesterfield Road, are the two large um, uh, retail park units. Actually, one of them split, into, split again into two, but it's uh, home base, uh, farm foods and Dunelm, for those that are familiar with the location. 
and then there's residential properties on the uh, on, on the eastern boundary. Uh, between the site and, and the retail park is a very significant uh, drop in, in land level um, in the order of 30 to 40 metres uh, formed by a, uh, a former quarry quarry edge. Um, and we'll see some images of that uh, as, we, as we go forward. Uh, so that's an aerial view of the site. Uh, and you'll see that, um, just recalling the, the, the boundary, you'll see that the, the bottom... Uh, edge of the site, the southern edge, uh, is quite heavily wooded. Uh, there's a group tree preservation order in that part of the site, and there are individual uh, tree preservation orders um, along the, the rest of the site, um, and a number of other trees which aren't don't have any specific protection. Um, I'll flick through the images uh, as I go. Um, the site previously housed. Uh, dwellings which were demolished in, we think, the 1960s. Um, as I say, the proposal for seven dwellings, the contemporary in form with individual uh, design, uh, although common language and materials, uh, which is largely, uh, in fact, I'll flick through to the images as we're talking. Uh, so you'll see from the, those images there that, uh, and, and the ones that follow, that there are individually designed properties, contemporary in form, but they do have common uh, features, uh, such that they hang together as a, as a scheme. Um, uh, render and both timber and metal uh, cladding. Um, and this is actually phase two um, to a development which came to committee probably a year or so ago, 18 months ago, maybe longer. Um, which was also for, uh, in the order of seven dwellings at the head of um, Newsham um, Road, Mearsbrook Avenue, uh, at, that, at, that end, at that northern end of the site. Um, in terms of the trees on the site, the, the vast majority are being retained. Uh, you, can, you can hopefully see from that layout, it's quite awkward with the development of this scale, but you can hopefully see from that layout where the dwellings are. Um, there are three in the southern uh, portion of the site um, and then two in the middle uh, which which uh, are kind of sideways onto the road if you like um, and, and two further in the in the northern corner uh, that's, as I say vast majority of trees on the site are retained and I'll talk a bit more about that later um, there's uh, a number of representations that you'll see from from the report a mixture of objection and, and support um, I'm not going to go through all those uh, now but, uh, because they're detailed in the report. Uh, it's in, in land use terms, it's a housing area um, in the UDP and also in the draft uh, local plan, um, which obviously has less weight at this stage. It is maintaining its, its allocation as a residential zone. Uh, the, the nature of the site, the constraints on it, um, both in terms of geometry and, uh, and vegetation, lead to quite a low density development, uh, 22 dwellings per hectare, and that's against a, a, a guide um, of 30 to 50 dwellings per hectare within the core strategy policies. Um, but we feel that that density is appropriate in, in, in this uh, particular instance. Indeed, if it was increased, it would, it would result in significant loss of trees uh, and some questionable uh, arrangements between dwellings. Um, it is a greenfield site. Uh, policy allows for that up to a maximum of 12% um, of completions on greenfield sites. Uh, we're currently around 6 or 7%, so it, it, it's comfortably within that, that margin. Um, it will result in an obvious change in the appearance of the site. Uh, there is a further image along here which may help to demonstrate to some extent what I mean. That, that's a, uh, a street elevation effectively from Derbyshire Lane, the top version being without development um, and, and the one below being with, but you can see that the dwellings are, are well spaced out across the site. Um, in, in some areas, uh, partially obscured by vegetation as well. Um, so the, the appearance of the site will change considerably, uh, but the, the, the low density nature of it 
uh, and the appropriate scale of the dwellings, the space in between them, means that it retains its overall uh, green character. Um, there's a bound, oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around the slides a little here, but uh, there's a boundary wall along a lot of the frontage, you can see there, there, uh, which throughout its length is being retained other than where uh, there'd be an opening for, for vehicle access uh, and repaired, um, which is a positive of the scheme. Um, it would also be very prominent, it's fair to say, uh, on the views from the quarry edge. This is the quarry edge. Um, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, that, that's where the houses would sit, uh, or some of them at least, at the top of there, so it would clearly be prominent from there because they are sited quite close to the edge. Uh, but we don't feel that's in a, an inappropriate condition. Uh, lots of similar kind of ridge lines uh, in the city um, have houses upon them, so it's quite a common feature. Uh, and this image you can just about make out um, either, either side of the tallest lamp, uh, lamp column. Uh, you can see uh, three blocks effectively. They're the houses that have been built as part of, of phase one, so it would be a similar impact to that continued along the, uh, along the skyline. Um, the, the layouts of the houses uh, provide good quality uh, living accommodation for, for future occupants, uh, the reasonable sized gardens, uh, good outlooks, some fantastic views uh, to, the, to the west would be achieved. Um, and in terms of the impact on Derbyshire Lane residents who are the closest, the, they're those kind of to the right hand west eastern side of the drawing. Um, the distance there is, exceeds 20 meters in all in all circumstances, uh, and is across a road uh, as well, uh, which minimizes uh, any impact. And again, there is considerable spacing between them, so there's, there's not a kind of a wall of development, if you like. So we feel that given that's across the highway and, and uh, yeah, significant distance, we don't feel there's any issues there in terms of overbearing or, uh, or loss of privacy. Um, in terms of the I'll leave it on this slide, I think, because it's the one that shows it in its greatest context. The, the, the trees survey and the trees on the site have informed the layout. As I said, the vast majority have been retained. Uh, removals are of uh, lesser quality or, or in, in uh, poor condition. Um, and there are replacements proposed which are of a greater number than those which have been lost. Um, there are green roofs on plots four to seven. Um, and, and hedgerows between plots and, and, and green wall features on, on the dwellings as well, if I go the right way. Uh, it's not an entire green wall, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of almost like a cabling which allow, allows and promotes uh, growth up it. Um, all of those are, are positive features um, and, and contribute to biodiversity. Uh, in terms of ecological impact, a uh, survey was undertaken and there were no constraints to development identified uh, and overall there is a net gain in biodiversity. Uh, it's a sustainable location, um, it, it's, it's close to other housing and, and on other facilities, uh, public transport links etc and there are strong sustainability credentials within the, within the scheme, um, the fabric first approach, uh, solar panels, uh, for example, within the, within the roofs. Um, land stability was raised by uh, a number of objectors and the, uh, the applicant undertook land stability assessment which, which raised no, no concerns in, in that regard. Uh, so we're satisfied that that meets um, the planning requirement there. Um, in highways terms, uh, access is considered acceptable. There are uh, sort of if I go along here, you'll see the uh, occasional sort of punched opening in the wall for, for driveways, effectively. Uh, it's one way at this point, Derbyshire Lane. Um, members may be aware of that. Um, and, and there are no highways concerns with those access points and adequate parking uh, provided. Uh, so taking all that into account and noting the significant weight um, given to the requirement of paragraph 11, um, 
and the application of a tilted balance, uh, given there's no significant adverse effects. Our recommendation is approval, Chair. Uh, I must just draw attention, though, to the supplementary report to, to make sure members are aware of some additional representations, which I'll briefly touch on. Um, that's item two on the supplementary agenda. Uh, so we've had four additional representations since the report was published. Uh, some were from um, addresses that have previously objected, reiterating concerns, having seen the uh, report, uh, and one was an additional um, address. Uh, none of those raised comments haven't already been covered in the report, or, or nor did they change the weighting of the planning balance or result in a different recommendation. Um, a couple of points that were picked up, we'll just expand on a little, is there's mention again in the representations of a grave on the site, uh, and a photograph was submitted as part of a representation that showed an inscribed stone. So when, when that's being viewed on site, it actually sits within a pile of what appears to be discarded stone and, and, and other features uh, uh, that occur in several other places across the site. Um, however, we have carried out some further uh, visits and assessment with, our, with the South Yorkshire Archaeological Service and, and remain of the view that that stone doesn't mark the site of a burial and that there's no further archaeological assessment work needed. Uh, so we think we've addressed that issue, Chair. Um, and reference to, to gases, et cetera, is covered through the conditions that are already recommended. Um, and then there was some criticism of the amount of documents that people had had to wade through, but that's inevitable, Chair, on a, on a site of this complexity where it's a, it's a necessity that an applicant undertakes work of that nature. And then finally, uh, the... Heading to the report, uh, the main agenda report, referred to the uh, production of the national or publishing of the national planning policy framework uh, effectively on the day that the uh, reports were finalised, Chair. So we didn't have time to reflect those in here. So there's a brief paragraph there uh, which explains that the only real change that affects this application is a shift from a, a need to demonstrate a five year supply to, to four years and a very slight adjustment in the figure there. Um, from uh, 2.87 years to 2.71 years supply in Sheffield's case. That doesn't change any of the, uh, the discussion or uh, consideration within the report. And then, very finally, um, we've listed the paragraph numbers that have changed as a result of that publication. So, uh, it's just, it remains a recommendation to approve, Chair. Thank you, Chris. Okay, uh, we have one person wishing to speak on this development. So I'm going to ask Mr. James Norton to come forward. Five minutes, Mr. Norton. Madam Chair, councillors uh, and officers. Um, my name is James Norton. Uh, I'm a director of Sustainable Shell Homes with the applicant, um, along with my colleague Sarah Foxwell. I'm also one of the architects of the scheme. Uh, we're, as Chris says, we're pleased to present the phase two of our all support and successful development of low energy houses in Mearsbrook. Um, and it was a pleasure to show me around yesterday. Um, you can get to see me in kind of like the suit version compared to the builder version. I've lived in Sheffield my whole life. Uh, like Sarah, I trained at Sheffield University. My co-director, Peter, is also here, has lived in the city for three decades, working at the university, including roles of Dean of Civil and Structural Engineering, which is, of course, relevant on this site, and Pro Vice Chancellor. I've lived in Mearsbrook itself for 20 years, taken on a number of voluntary and community roles during that time, building my career around a conviction to preserve our environment, principally through the design of low energy and low environmental impact for houses and buildings. Our company was set up by Peter and myself a few years ago from these shared passions, specifically to provide greater access to the dream of creating and or living in a low energy home. Um, as we know, approximately 50% of our emissions come from our, uh, our houses and to answer therefore the threat of climate change and resource depletion. We're with options for self-builders to fit out their houses to issue from a shell stage, 
uh, or have us uh, complete a bespoke like fit out for them. Uh, because of that, we provide opportunities for those individuals and indeed our own team to learn the new green economy skills that are going to be required to deliver these houses and the consequent environmental gains. As an architect uh, and the applicant, and also as a local resident, this site has presented an opportunity to deliver a sensitive and comprehensive scheme going far above and beyond the requirements of policy often. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to work with and be supported by your officers. Uh, deliver a much needed scheme on a site, as Chris said, a site that once had houses on it and indeed is allocated as residential in both the UDP and the local plan. Throughout, we've engaged and worked closely with Chris and his officers, council's highway engineers, landscape architects and ecologists, as well as councillors. Uh, and the scheme has evolved little through that, providing, um, with us providing additional information, design development and additional reports where, we, where required. If we're to meet the demands of replenishing our housing stock, highlighted by Tilton Balance, with new, new low energy homes, it's challenging sites like this that the LPA uh, will need to work with developers and designers on. Clearly, the striking quarry location presents such a challenge. However, with a combination of extensive, intrusive visual and analytical surveys by our team of highly qualified geotechnical engineers, which is then further corroborated by two further uh, geotechnical engineering firms who were previously and currently appointed by the adjoining owners who we work closely with, we're completely happy um, that the development and the land it's built on is completely stable and sound. We obviously wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, in terms of specifically ecological habitat, um, we've worked closely with our, as well as the city ecologists, our, our local landscape architect and ecologist, um, our ecologists have done around six visits to certain surveys of the site over the last two years to develop a scheme that preserves a relatively modest habitat on the site, with 75% of that site completely, either completely untouched or replaced with soft landscaping uh, where there's new trees with native species. Half of that area will then be specifically enhanced and protected, creating habitat corridors to link the protected tree groups with a much more extensive habitat on the other side of the quarry fence. In total, the number of trees on the site will be increased from 177 to 186, including the replacement of just 12 poor quality trees, several of which, as we said, are at the direct request of the local authority. This means that although there's no locally adopted policy for biodiversity net gain, we have shown, using our own methodology, an increase in habitat and biodiversity. Alongside the integrated landscape, this is made possible by being a lower density provision than we might otherwise put forward. Um, we feel this is just a great opportunity for members to help deliver a sensitive and considered project wholly in accordance with policy, irrespective of tilt and balance, supported at every stage by your officers and other experts, comprising contemporary super insulated houses with high ecological value landscape and design, green walls and green roofs, Chris said, but solar panels, electric vehicle charging points, as well as other ecological enhancements, as well as the opportunity for homeowners to be involved and customize their internal light to suit their needs. Supporting a Sheffield company like this to upskill its workforce, to teach homeowners about low energy design and construction, is exactly what building a green economy looks like. You've had your five minutes okay. now. Finish. I was just going to say, uh, which can help answer the challenge of climate change we all face. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Chris, do you want to say anything? Uh, no, Chair, I don't think I need to respond to that. Right, councillors' questions. Councillor Downing? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've just got two, two questions, and it comes from the list of representations. Uh, I was on the site yesterday with one or two others of, of the committee, uh, and uh, I did notice, and I did mention it, uh, the, the steepness of the driveways. In, in the winter time. I can imagine that this could be very, very dangerous. Um, uh, and the other one was, although I didn't see any, um, there was some uh, uh, a, a, a presence of, is there presence of Japanese knotweed because on the site because it's not been acknowledged if there is any. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chair, uh, if I answer the Japanese knotweed point, we'll ask Helen to answer the, um, the driveway question. So there is a reference to that within the report. Um, and sorry, Chair, I'm just 
looking for the right page. Uh, just bear with me. Um, there's, bo there's both a reference to that within the report and a condition listed, which is uh, the condition first is number 10. Uh, so that requires that before development commences, uh, a, a full site walkover survey is carried out by a, an appropriate person, um, which should then be submitted to the to ourselves for approval, and that should identify whether there's any not be present on the site, and if it is, um, it to then include a method, a method statement for how that would be eradicated. Uh, however, the the ecology survey that took place at the time didn't identify anything. So the current situation is, as far as we're concerned, there isn't any, but just in case there will be uh, at any point in the future or it's been missed, then there is a, a condition requiring a further walkover survey. Uh, if Helen wouldn't mind answering the point on the, on the driveways. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, details were submitted of the drive gradients, the steepest of which is one in 15. Um, the others are, are less steep than that. Our guidance is that gradients shouldn't exceed one in 12. That's considered to be a sort of maximum gradient. So what is actually proposed is better than our maximum. So we will consider that to be quite useful and safe. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, are we just concerned about the, um, the uh, in severe weather conditions, that's all, but then again, I suppose that would be the responsibility of the, the people that use it. Thank you. Cheers. Councillor Nottage. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to applaud the developer for their approach towards the biodiversity and the insulation of the buildings um, and the fabric first approach to construction that's sounding um, all very encouraging and definitely the direction I think we should be heading in. Um, in terms of condition 15 when it comes to the maintenance of the green roof for a period of five years after construction, I imagine the buildings are expected to stay up an awful lot longer than that five year period. Um, would, it be pre would it be prejudicial to the development to extend that period? Uh, Chair, I don't think it would. And um, I would have no issue. And in fact, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the correct, now I'm looking at that and now it's been uh, pointed out, I'm wondering if the correct version of the conditions being applied um, because we did recently uh, change the approach and, and require that for, for a longer period uh, for the lifetime of the development, essentially. Um, and I don't believe that will be prejudicial to the, um, to the development. It's an integral part of the scheme. Um, so from my point of view, I would have no uh, objections to the condition being tweaked to, to allow for that. That's okay. Chair, um, if members are minded to amend that condition, um, we'd need a proposer, a seconder, and then a vote on that. Um, uh, so I don't know whether um, anybody wants to take that forward. Thank you. Yeah, just to say to the office, I'd be perfectly happy to propose that as an amendment um, to change five years to the lifetime of the building. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah, yeah I'll second that, Chair. <laughs> okay, fine. Thank you. Does it involve Senate now? I believe, uh, sorry, Councillor Redhart. Richard Jinks. Yeah, I've got a quick question on that. Is lifetime of the building a recognised term? Which to me sounds a little bit vague. And I don't know how, in building terms, does it have a real meaning? Chair. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I believe that. I might be misrecalling, but I think the planning officer referred to the lifetime of development, which I think would be a more commonly understood term. Uh, but if members are minded to take this forward, um, the proposal could be that the final wording of the amended condition is delegated to the planning officer and the co-chairs, just so that we can reflect upon that. But I, I, you know, at first glance, I would think the lifetime of development would be an acceptable uh, amendment to make in this instance. Thank you, Chair. Just a reminder that despite what we've, the proposal on saying, that we do still need to vote on that amendment. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
What should we do? Show of hands. Would you like anybody in favour? I think that's unanimous. Okay, fine. Anyone else with any questions? Richard? Thank you, Chair. Um, you talk quite a lot since it comes out in the report about density. Um, can I be reassured that this is clearly outside our current guidelines, what's the current guidelines. That won't create a precedent that can be used in other areas. There's sufficiently special circumstances here that will go govern against that. Uh, yes, Chair. I mean, the, the guidelines do allow for variation, uh, almost specifically written to allow for circumstances where either site constraints or the character of the area don't promote that kind of density. The, so the densities are intended to cover kind of large areas of the city or, or circumstances which are based largely around accessibility, public transport and what have you. But they also recognise that there will be sites and circumstances where that has to be uh, changed. So this wouldn't be the first scheme to, to go down that route. And indeed, sometimes the density goes the other way, uh, a higher density, which again can sometimes be appropriate. So it wouldn't of itself create any form of precedent. It's, it's perfectly allowed for within the, uh, within the policy wording. Okay. Any comments? Thank you, Chair. It's, it's, only, it's only a small comment, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased and happy that this has come forward. Uh, it's a good design and uh, well spotted. Anyway, for that, uh, to extent that for you. Uh, the young architect chap here, he, uh, the only thing you missed that, it, it, is, it is on page 19 on under 17, uh, the rainwater. I thought you were going to make my, make my day and actually say we're going to use the rainwater to flush the toilet, but uh, he didn't. So I'm a little bit upset, but it's a good sight and I shall, uh, shall be supporting it. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Davison. Uh, yes, I... I went to the site visit yesterday, as uh, a number of people did. Uh, I was very impressed, really, with ha how they were going to uh, fit houses onto this particular site. It's a site that uh, larger companies wouldn't even look at, so I think it's, uh, it's excellent that we've got uh, an organisation, a smaller organisation, which has uh, very great concerns about the economy and wants, uh, sorry, the uh, ecology and wants to look after it. Uh, is uh, actually going to put innovative housing on this site, which of course means that uh, the turning around of some of the uh, houses to, to, to fit the, uh, the land available. So I'm very much in favour of, um, of uh, the development here. Any more comments? Yeah. Right, shall we move to a vote then, please? For the official recommendation, Chair. Four, Chair. Yes, Chair. Four. Four, Chair. For the recommendation. For the recommendation. For the recommendation, Chair. Four, Chair. Four, Chair. Four, Chair. Four, Chair. Thank you very much. Seems unanimous. Thank you. Right, so we now move to planning item, item 7C, application 23OB007, and it's a building within the curtage of KFC 236 Queen's Road, Highfield, Sheffield S2. Chair, not this thing. Um, okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, so this site uh, is quite prominently located on Queen's Road. Um, you see the large junction there where the retail park 
is in the kind of southern corner opposite the side and and the b and q um, unit uh, in the top right hand corner um, the on the western side of the junction is uh, a KFC uh, largely drive through um, facility uh, and this site uh, is essentially utilizing the same access and the uh, mostly redundant car park uh, of that of that facility you see to the west there there is the river sheaf uh, and a section of uh, the river sheaf walk exists um, uh, from Charlotte Road uh, to the building immediately to the south southwest of the uh, of the application site. Um, that shows it in a bit more detail, uh, and you can just about pick out the the walk in a kind of a. Um, I'm not quite sure what colour to call it. Yeah, <laughs> sort of light, light, light reddy brown uh, colour um, adjacent to the trees and and, and the river. Um, you can also see that the. Uh, the site is predominantly, well, entirely hard surfaced uh, existing car park. Um, and you can see the, the KFC unit there as well. So I'll just quickly run through some images. Uh, this is looking away from the KFC unit to the adjacent building, um, which is the uh, carpet and furniture uh, warehouse, as the signs suggest. Um, that little bit of vegetation there, that hedge, uh, or, or collection of shrubs uh, is the only vegetation on the site uh, and that would that would be removed as part of this development. I'll, I'll say more about that in a, in a sec. Um, you can see Queen's Road there and, and, the, and a knee rail uh, boundary treatment to edge of the car park. That's part of the walk. Uh, so you see that people would recognise the... Um, the, the railing uh, to the right, which is on, on most, if not all, of our, uh, our walks. Um, this isn't, it's built to adoptable standards, but it isn't uh, adopted yet, as yet, mainly because, as you can see where that graffiti is, it, it comes to a sudden halt and doesn't uh, rejoin another highway at any point. Um, this is looking back towards Queen's Road and the retail park opposite. Uh, and the building that I'll show you shortly will, will sit uh, up against the uh, the gable wall that you can see there. Uh, that's a view back towards the walkway across the car park uh, and some slightly uh, uh, more zoomed in views um, there of the of the river. Uh, that's the access from uh, Charlotte Road. Uh, so the the walkway is to the right of those panels there and that that bin um, uh, towards the um, the property with the gable end, and that's a slightly better view of it. Um, there are quite a number of these chairs, but just quickly flipping through. And that's taken from the opposite side of the road, so that will be from uh, the, the retail park, which shows a, a kind of a, a, a dropped curb uh, and, and sort of a pedestrian refuge at that point. Uh, this is looking toward that building there is a student block, student accommodation block, which can be viewed across the site on the other side of the river. Uh, and here we are looking down Charlotte Road, effectively, uh, to the KFC. We, the building will be in the far right-hand corner of that car park. Uh, I think I'm nearly done, Chair, with, uh, with photographs. But um, this is looking down uh, Charlotte Road, again, at the access point. Uh, and that's the end of the picture. Um, so, um, the site is... Uh, Despite its location, it's in a housing area uh, in, in UDP terms, um, but in the draft local plan, it would uh, change to a flexible use zone. Um, the application for a drive-through facility. It's quite hard to pick out on that particular drawing, but it, it's, um, I mean, you can obviously see where the vehicles go and the building is, um, is on the uh, southern edge of that. Um, there are 10 internal covers within the building and a couple of external ones under a canopy, and then um, and then there is an area for uh, external seating, which you can uh, you can just about pick out. Uh, there are three rectangular blocks, picnic tables, effectively marked um, on that 
um, on, on the site, on the Queen's Road frontage. Hopefully you can see that, which I could point with this, but uh, I can't. Um, in fact, the, the external seating area is, obviously the green circles are trees, the, the external seating area is immediately to the, to the west of those, uh, those trees. Um, so there are, uh, say, 10 covers uh, and some external seating. Um, there are eight parking spaces uh, dedicated uh, to this facility, which you can, you can see there. Um, and two disabled, sorry, in addition, in, in addition to that, there are two disabled spaces, so that's 10 in total, uh, and a small amount of cycle parking um, adjacent to the, the, the chief walk. Uh, on that northern boundary of the site, northwestern boundary of the site. Um, some additional landscaping is proposed uh, in the form of those trees and low level planting beneath it, then in the bot very bottom corner of the site and a very small amount uh, adjacent to a bin store, which um, would be separated from the walk by a hedge, uh, which is where I think it says H1 in the top, top left hand corner. Uh, there were a number of objections. Uh, over 20, around 22 objections, principally relating to the relationship with the river uh, and the walk and feeling that the layout didn't uh, maximise the benefit uh, that, that uh, it could bring uh, to users of the walk and, and the relationship with it. Um, the use is acceptable in policy terms, both in, in current and, uh, and future policy direction. Uh, the site is in uh, flood zone three. Um, a sequential test was therefore undertaken, uh, but no preferable sites um, were found within the search area. Um, it is in fact a less, less vulnerable development uh, in, in the hierarchy. Uh, a flood risk assessment was undertaken and that sets uh, appropriate floor levels, um, you know, above ground level, and, and the environment agency are, are comfortable with that. Um, the building design is, is quite typical of um, a fast food uh, drive-through uh, outlet, uh, but it doesn't, I think it's fair to say it doesn't lack interest. The, the very bland elevation uh, on the bottom left-hand corner would actually be, would directly face the, the gable wall of the other building and, and would not be read within the street scene. It's, there's only about a metre gap or so between the two buildings. Um, so the most prominent elevation would be that in the top left-hand corner and, and top right, effectively. Um, in, in addition, the bottom right-hand elevation would be visible from the, uh, from the walk. Um, so there's, there's a reasonable amount of glazing within the prominent elevations, some variation in it, uh, both in terms of form and materials. Uh, it's largely brick. <laughs> Um, with with cladding and glazing, as I say, it's a building typical of uh, of the form. Um, this elevation shows you the scale of it, which is is relatively small and somewhat underscaled, I would say, for the uh, for the context of the site. It's a, a very wide arterial route into the city, where a building of of, of much more significance could be accommodated. Um, but uh, we're, you know, we're, we're assessing the proposal that's before us and uh, what it does do this is at the moment the site is really quite barren um, and, and bleak almost in that it's just a, 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 a tarmac and concrete uh, car park that's very underused um, and this will at least provide some, some life and activity uh, on the street frontage, there's glazing there. Well, you know, there will be visible activity within the unit, um, and there's some tree planting going in on the frontage, which will be a benefit, and will actually replace some trees that were there until about 2016. Uh, that for some reason the owners decided to remove. Um, the access to the site is unaltered. Uh, I've just got to check which way I'm going here. Uh, so the access is, you may recall, oh, sorry, let's go through all these, uh, <laughs> is back to the beginning here. It's the existing access uh, which is retained and, and would be used for, for the same uh, operation, for both operations. Uh, there's a reduced level of car parking overall, 
Um, for both, well, so the, the KFC unit is, is car parking has been reduced because he doesn't use it. Uh, and, and the amount that's provided for both is considered uh, acceptable. Um, there's no actual physical impact on the river walk, although the layout does provide pedestrian links to it. Uh, you know, in the layout, and, and that will uh, enable uh, better access, promote access to the uh, to the river walk. Um, the the building's in a sustainable location. Um, it, it's, there's some synergy with the existing with the existing operation to some extent, um, and. Uh, in terms of and other kind of matters of sort of sustainable development, the drainage strategy that was put forward is actually, as you'll see in the report, is unresolved or was unresolved um, because the applicant wanted to pursue an, pursue an approach that we didn't find acceptable, which was just to go straight into the, uh, the, the system, whereas we feel a more sustainable method can be achieved um, or should at least be explored. So condition seven requires that to happen. Um, and given the, it's currently devoid of any uh, significant landscape features, uh, those works that are taking place will provide a small enhancement uh, to biodiversity. So if we just draw members' attention to item one, I think it is on the supplementary uh, information. Again, there have been some additional representations, Chair. Um, uh, one was a supportive representation uh, and that was from an address that hadn't previously commented, um, who felt it would be a valid, valuable addition to the area. The other objection was a joint objection uh, from the three councillors listed there. Um, and um, we, we've set out the, the reasons for, for their concerns um, and where those matters aren't covered within the report, we, we've responded to that uh, uh, beneath there. Um, so, the, uh, just to clarify, the site isn't open space, uh, as was inferred in the objection. It's um, it's housing area, uh, and it's an existing car park. Uh, we talked there about the what I've just mentioned about the, the landscaping, um, and there's an overall reduction. There's a concern about increased increased parking spaces and um, an increased activity. Uh, impact on uh, cycle routes and what have you. Um, and there's a reference there to reduction in the number of car parking spaces, uh, albeit acknowledging that there would be some increased activity on the site. Um, and, the, and just to be clear there, there's a reference to the, uh, the status uh, of the walk uh, and that the proposal doesn't propose any, anything which would uh, hinder or el eliminate access to the existing section of the walk. Um, and as I said, we feel that there would be some uh, benefit to the presence of this additional facility. There was also, Chair, um, a duplication of one condition within the conditions that were listed. So the correct condition has been uh, referred to there, condition 14. Um, and then again, the amended paragraphs, updated paragraphs for the MPPF. The changes that took place to the MPPF have no consequence on this application, Chair. So, I made a recommendation uh, for approval. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay, we'd like to invite speakers now. So, could I ask Mr. Simon Ogden to speak? You have five minutes, Mr. Ogden. Thank you. Um, I. Uh, I'm the chair of the Sheep and Poultry Rivers Trust. Um, I also chair the council's waterway strategy group, but I'm not speaking on their behalf in this case. Um, and I'm here to represent uh, the Sheep and Porters objection along with 20 others um, to uh, the, uh, the layout uh, and treatment of, of the site. Um, we've asked that the public sitting area uh, be placed next to the river, that the bins and extraction be placed away from the river and that some improvement to the canalised river channel is included in the conditions on the application. The report uh, officer's report actually calls this application a missed opportunity, and we would support that view. It's a missed opportunity for three reasons. 
it's a missed opportunity for users and customers of the um, cafe uh, who will be only offered the, opportunity, the option of sitting um, next to a heavily trafficked uh, road with poor air quality and noise and very little uh, uh, in the way of pleasant environment rather than being able to sit overlooking a, a recovering uh, uh, river. It will be a loss for the River Sheaf itself um, because uh, there is no improvement proposed to the River Sheaf. And I would refer uh, members to Hollis's um, CS73 in the uh, retained policy from the um, Community Development Plan. A strategic green network will be maintained and where possible enhanced, which will follow the rivers and streams of the main valleys. And policy GE17. As part of the development of the green network, all rivers and streams will be protected and enhanced for the benefit of wildlife and where appropriate for public access and recreation. And this will be done uh, through the development control process. We don't feel that those policies have really been um, given much weight in the assessment of the application. Um, the sheet, the sheet from River Trust, uh, Port, Port River Trust, um, operates a group of river rangers who do cleanups, uh, litter picks regularly along the river corridor. What they report is that one of the worst problems they face is where commercial bins are located next to the riverbank. Uh, because um, I'm sure when you visited the site, you said it was all neat and tidy, but it isn't always like that. Uh, and this proposal will double the number of bins that are located next to the river. And you only have to go down and have a look at what happens, for instance, on Suffolk Road next to uh, the queue parks at the station to see how much plastic and packaging gets in the river quarter every week uh, in association with commercial bins that are located right on the river bank. Um, so moving the bins away from the river bank, we think, is an absolute essential. Um, we don't think any of these are big or costly requests. Um, we think that um, not requiring this development to contribute to the improvement of the uh, river channel set, uh, both repeats past, uh, past mistakes and also sets a poor precedent for the future. Um, I note from the report uh, that you have the opportunity to defer this application technically and I would urge you to use this opportunity uh, to ask officers and developers to reconsider and come back with a better treatment of the river. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Right. Uh, can we now have Rachel Martin? Good afternoon, Chair, members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about this application. The development proposes the erection of a restaurant and drive-through on an underused area of land currently occupied by a car parking and bins associated with the existing KFC restaurant. Officers have said that the principle of development is acceptable and in accordance with local policies. As shown on the proposed site plan and the street scene, the proposed building will enhance the current appearance of the site, formalising its use by providing a new restaurant, drive-through, clear pedestrian routes, new landscaping and concealing existing bins within a formal bin store. We note the objections which have been received, in particular those from ward members and the Sheaf and Porter River Trust. And I would note the following elements of the plan and points that, of your officer's report. The application site comprises an unattractive area of existing car park and area occupied by bins associated with the KFC. The riverside walk terminates at the western edge of the application site, adjacent to building 264 Queens Road. Pedestrians using the riverside walk currently cross the car park in, via informal routes to Queens Road. The scale of the proposed building maintains views and visibility of the riverside walk and does not impact the future usability of it. There is no increase in hard standing. The application site comprises existing hard standing which will be relined. Indeed, the application proposes to break up some of the areas of hard standing to introduce planting beds and three trees. The proposed site plan maintains pedestrian access from the Riverside Walk to Queen's Road, providing new formal routes across and crossing points. The seating area at the front of the site 
promotes activity and interest to the existing frontage, Queen's Road frontage of the site. There are no objections from highway officers and the highway supporting statement submitted with the application concludes the site is in a sustainable location and the proposal would not result in any detrimental impact on capacity or road safety. In accordance with NPPF, the development would not result in any unacceptable impact on highway safety. Cycle parking for four bicycles is provided in a convenient and visible location for bikes accessing the site using the cycle lane on Queens Road and Charlotte Road and the Riverside Path. The development will result in the creation of 15 new jobs at the site, making an effective and efficient use of an area of underused land to provide economic benefits to the community and economy in accordance with the sustainable development principles detailed in NPPF. Your officers have concluded that overall the character, appearance and layout of the scheme mitigates any potential impacts and there are no conflicts with NPPF or other local planning policies. There are no objections from your officers subject to appropriate conditions and we would therefore ask you to support the officers' conclusions. Many thanks. Thank you. Right. Any questions? Uh, I think, Chair, just to comment on um, on Simon's points that uh, he raised, and, and to say that I think we've said within the report, but um, in terms of the layout, uh, we we did seek enhancement because we didn't fundamentally disagree with the points that were raised, um, and felt that in the eventuality, or even in its current state, uh, of, of the walk being extended, that to have seating adjacent to the river would obviously be a, a beneficial thing. Um, and acknowledging that the seating, uh, on the one hand, isn't necessarily uh, in the most beneficial location adjacent to what is a very busy highway. Um, so we did uh, approach the applicant to amend the layout. Um, but there are constraints, whilst it's a large car park, uh, there are constraints around uh, ensuring that a facility that has to uh, be serviced um, functions as a drive-through with the way that the lanes and everything have to operate. Um, there were limitations on, on how, that, how that could be achieved. Now, that's not to say that uh, it isn't possible to produce a better layout chair. Um, but ultimately, the applicant returned to us with the changes that they were willing to make. Um, and, and beyond that, we, we are in a position where we then have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And whilst we don't disagree, I think, with, with that, that uh, the layout could be better to better address the, the, the walk, um, we have to ask ourselves whether it's reasonable to refuse permission on, on that basis. And we didn't think it was, Chair. We didn't think it met that kind of that bar or that, that, that threshold. Um, what the seating in its lo location on Queen's Road does do is provide a little bit of interest and animation for, to, to the street and bring a bit of bit of surveillance activity, etc., uh, to the street frontage, uh, which is a positive of that. Uh, and the bins have to go somewhere. And, and in a better layout, we may have ended up with bins, if, unless they were enclosed within the building, of course, uh, in a more prominent location. So that's why ultimately we, we, we recommended the application for approval. Um, the bins are in the, in fact, I will, uh, the bins are in this top corner. Um, again, I, I can't point, I'm afraid, but uh, the vehicles that are, are coming into the site uh, are almost adjacent to the second vehicle. You can see a series of kind of, uh, boxes with uh, with lines within them that uh, they're within a, a timber housing um, I'm not pretending that the timber housing is 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 particularly beautiful um, but, but it encloses the the bins uh, such that uh, assuming it will be managed which it which it's a it's an active site it, it, we expect it will be um, then we haven't got a series of bins where individuals will be kind of leaving them and, and they'll be overflowing. There'll be commercial bins that are, are used for the purposes of the operation chair. Uh, there will be a small amount of planting that's not shown on there. In fact, it's shown on the next one along, I think. A very small amount of planting that 
partially screens um, the uh, the bin store. Um, but as I say, overall, we, we acknowledged the uh, requests that were being made. We did put them forward to the applicant, uh, or should I say we put some of them forward. We always have to feel, you know, are the, are the, uh, are the benefits that m we might be able to achieve from amending a layout uh, or, um, or that go beyond the site boundary in some instances? Are they proportionate to the development? And we didn't feel that works to the to the river, uh, improving you know, your naturalisation works, etc., that have taken place on other schemes along the along the um, along the Shee, uh, were proportionate to, to the development, given that it was a relatively minor addition to an existing operating site rather than a whole scale redevelopment as has occurred elsewhere further up on Little London Road, for example, is one which came to committee maybe two years ago, where that was wholesale redevelopment of, of the site and quite a, a number of extensive uh, pieces of work are being, have been undertaken to the river as part of that. We just didn't feel it was proportionate in this case to, to go that far with this chair. I think that's all I, I wanted to say. <laughs> Councillor Downing. Yeah, I'm just I'm just a little bit unclear about the bins that the uh, that the uh, that Simon raised. Um, are these litter bins that are along along the edge of the river, or is it? Are, are we are we talking about the bin storage? I'm just thinking, if it's litter bins, individual litter bins, can we condition that these bins are away from the river edge? You know, the, you know. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, the bins are, are, are where, I've, where I've described uh, on there. So if, if you, uh, the commercial bins, sorry, is, this, is the first answer to Councillor Downing's questions. Uh, they are uh, those, those which are, um, Dan is going to helpfully point them, point them out. So they're there in that location there. So they're, they're, the, com they're the commercial bins. Um, thank you. Uh, and, and that is, a, is an image of the, the timber housing and a slightly larger, um, well, significantly larger plan showing the, uh, the arrangement of them. So they'll be within, behind the pair of double doors, accessed by, um, by staff um, when, when sorting the waste. Nottage, did you want to speak? Yes, okay, I thought you put your hand up earlier. Right. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, a very quick question, and then what I will try and keep as uh, succinct as possible comment. The entrance to the site um, opposite Spruffix, is that not being widened as part of this? Because I used to live very near here, and there were frequently traffic issues relating to the fact that you can't go in and out of that car park at the same time. So you get a little backlog building up and there's dead space to either side of it, if they're not making it two feet wider, that's another missed opportunity as part of, part of this application. Chair, I wonder if Helen's the best place to answer that. Thanks, Chair. Uh, no, it, it isn't being widened. I mean, we're anticipating that the traffic flow is going to increase substantially, the fact that potentially it might reduce. So, no, there's no proposal to widen it. Okay. Okay. Um, well, we'll comment. Um, I mean, we're, I'm not going to go on about background for... Sorry, Chair. Um, it, it is usual to wait for comments till everybody's on, asked and okay, answered well. questions. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, we take we take uh, a massive leap forward sometimes in planning, but uh, we spoil it, and this application just flies in the face of all that. What we're doing in, in, in the past. Just across the road, uh, you mentioned the gas works, uh, which we all went on the site visit many years ago. And we, we, I can remember, we weren't going to have the footpath, and the university was saying, no, they wanted to build right up to, to the riverbank and all this, that, and the other. And we insisted, 
at their offices that we needed that space to walk up. Yes, it was up to, to a dead end, really. You could walk to a river. And again, here, we just, you know, we had the graffiti that I saw there. Well, it's a dead end. Yes, it is. But what are, you're just going to put a lovely, you're going to put a bin storage in a place where you can have a nice seating area outside a river. So you can look at, look at the river. You know, bubbling brook going past you by having your cut latte or whatever. You know what I mean? What a lovely thing to do. You know I, mean? I know we've got a problem with bin storage, but you're going to stick that. I have no idea. Uh, and then that's my rant, sorry, Chair, I do apologise. Uh, eight car parking spaces. Um, is that, that, those eight car parking spaces, they're going to be for staff as well. Um, and that, we're going to mention the, the entrance way. You know, I mean, really, you ought to be looking at highways just having a second look at that because that's a tight entrance. And like I say, you're waiting inside to come out and people are busy. And you've got major crossroads just there as well. So I do think that, you know, um, we need to have a second look at that as well. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I'm, I'm not sure what the question was in there. Uh, it, the, the, well, I know, the, all, all through the rant, I did put one in, I did put a question in, because I didn't want Chair to stop me, you know. I didn't want Chair to say, this is all comments, Gary, you've got to come back later. No, it's the, the, the car parking spaces, you know, the, 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 just for eight staff, uh, for, for, for members of public to use, or, you know. Just that I, again, I think Helen might be the best place to answer that, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, eight spaces. The, um, as part of the application, there was a transport statement submitted um, which gave details of the, the level, not the estimated level of, of vehicular traffic. As part of that, you can calculate um, a car parking accumulation, which is basically the, the maximum number of vehicles that are going to require the spaces. Based on the traffic figures that we've got then, we're looking at about um, six or seven being the maximum accumulation. Uh, in the PM peak and then potentially um, a, on, a, on a weekday um, at sort of lunchtime on a Saturday. Um, so the eight spaces, and, and that, sorry, those figures do include movements by staff and customers as well. It's not just one or the other. Um, so based on the fact that there's eight spaces, the information that's submitted, they should be able to accommodate to the, the likely parking demand. I think what you've also got to bear in mind is that it is a very accessible site as well. Um, and so there is potential, obviously, for people to walk, possibly use public transport, possibly not. But, um, yeah, based on the traffic flow, we do think that the eight spaces is adequate. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Chapman. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I have a concern that um, Simon's referenced um, two, two policies, CS73, which does get a mention in, in your report, Chris, but he also um, flags up GE17, and I've been reading back through the report to find some reference to that, um, because it is an ambition um, of, of Sheffield to improve our waterways <coughs> and, and to open them up. I mean, it's only um, last year that we um, agreed to open up the sheet where it meets the River Don. Um, and, and it does concern me that um, <coughs> we may be um, downplaying the importance of the, of the River Sheaf here um, um, in terms of access to the public um, and, and giving it more recognition, and and this application is right by the, by the waterside here. Um, so, I th have I missed it, or have we just not made reference to it in this application? Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm, I'm without. I'll have to quickly flick through uh, the report myself. Um, I don't recall it being in there, if I'm honest. Uh, and looking for it now, I can't see it either. Uh, and I don't have the, the full detail wording of it um, to determine how applicable it would be to this particular, um, 
particular item. Um, he, he, talk, he talked, if I remember, he talked about uh, protecting and enhancing um, the river uh, or rivers generally, waterways. And the development doesn't, uh, it doesn't impact, directly impact upon it. Um, and, and so it, it's, not, it's not in conflict with the protection of it because it's not doing anything harmful to it. Um, sorry, Chair, I've just been passed a, a copy of the, uh, of the policy, which I'll read in full, actually. It's probably easier if I do that. Um, so as part of the development of the green network, so the UDP has policies which, uh, and, and an ambition to create and protect a uh, green network. Uh, all rivers and streams will be protected and enhanced for the benefit of wildlife and where appropriate for public access and recreation. And that's achieved by, um, and the, the bits which actually there's only, there's an only an A and a C here, so I presume um, these are the ones which are considered most relevant. Um, that's by not permitting culverting, uh, unless necessary, encouraging reopening of water courses where opportunities arise. Uh, and expecting the setting back of any new development to an appropriate distance from the banks of major rivers to allow for landscaping. Uh, so I don't think Part A particularly applies here because we're not talking about reopening the watercourses. Uh, the, the watercourse exists, it's there. Uh, and the walkway exists and it's there. And that was a major consideration for us, I think, in this case. Uh, if we'd been in a situation where there was no walkway at all, then I think the picture might have been quite different. But there is a walkway that's present, and um, that, in the first instance, sets back naturally the, the, the ability to develop up to the river edge, uh, aside from any other considerations. Um, and I, I'm not going to pretend that the uh, extent of landscaping that's been achieved fully, fully complies with the ambitions of this policy, uh, but uh, we have so amendments to the layout to uh, improve that relationship slightly. And I think what's worth noting is we're not talking about a development that uh, is uh, reorientated. For example, if you imagine a development that was reoriented through uh, 90 degrees that, that kind of completely turned its back entirely on the, on the river. Um, it, it's a, it's a set, I don't have the exact dimension. It's a section of about probably four meters width, four and a half meters width. Um, which would be, uh, we're anticipating a future development at some stage which would allow for continuation of that walkway. So it's a relatively small section that would have some form of development immediately adjacent to it. Uh, and we didn't think, feel that that was sufficiently harmful to, to be in conflict with the overall ambitions of, of the policies that have been, been mentioned. I think that answers the question. Councillor Monahan. Thank you. I'm just wondering if we could go back about the relocation of the, the bin stores and ask if that could be changed. And particularly, I've been reading a lot this week about the amount of plastic that gets in our waterways, including our drinking water. And I really think we should be looking at any uh, rubbish that can be entering the River Sheaf. Um, with the best will, will in the world, people will dispose of their packaging where there is, you know, to throw it near a bin store or whatever. I know it may be used commercially, but other people will use it. And I want to do everything we can to stop littering in that area. That's my main concern. Um, if people are uh, silly enough to sit and eat their Dunkin' Donuts at the side of the river, then that's their choice, I suppose. And I do think we should look at the entrance again. I accept there's only, is it eight car parking spaces? Yeah, but it's only got 10 places. So it's mainly going to be a drive-through. So while there might not many people parking there, there will be people entering and exiting uh, that site. Uh, if it's going to be successful, it's going to be, have to be pretty frequently. And if, one, if it's difficult for one car to pass, as Henry noted, then it, it could be a problem. So I think we do need to look at the entrance to the site again. Is that possible? 
Uh, Chair, there were two points there. One was about the bin store relocation, and the other was reconsideration of the uh, of the entrance. Uh, I think Helen's explained on the entrance that we we feel, in highway safety terms, that is acceptable. Um, so I think the the option uh, open to members there is mm. is. Uh, Unless Vicky wants to suggest otherwise, is is to disagree with that with that judgment, um, but we don't, as far as Helen's concerned, uh, who's given us advice on that. We we she doesn't feel we don't therefore feel uh, that the um, the extent of use would be sufficient to warrant that uh, as a change. Um, otherwise, it would have been part of our discussions. Um, in terms of the bin store, uh, as I said. Earlier, we did we did uh, discuss with the applicant the uh, possibilities uh, of relocating the bin store to a less uh, prominent position from the from the walk. Uh, however, I think if if that's relocated um, elsewhere within the site, it's likely to be more prominent in a uh, in a wider context. Uh, and I think, therefore, the only, op uh, only option would be to enclose it fully within the building. Um, that said, uh, it's not my job to redesign uh, any layout. Um, so again, uh, that the opportunity there is, or the option, I suppose, is for uh, deferral uh, to, to seek uh, further negotiations on that point, um, or to come to a different view on the recommendation overall, Chair. I don't know if Vicky wants to add any more to that. Sorry. Thank you, okay. Chair. Um, just to, to remind the members in respect of um, at highway grounds uh, in terms of refusal, uh, it's paragraph 115 of the new NPPF, I believe, um, that states that development should only be prevented or refused on highway grounds if there would be an acceptable impact on highway safety or the residual cumulative impact on the road network would be severe. My understanding is that your highways officer doesn't think that that's the case in, in this instance. Um, I would just like to briefly take the opportunity, if I may, uh, just in respect of G17 that I believe Chris has, has read out, in respect of G17C, and he has referred to this being um, relevant. I'll just restate that, um, if that's okay. Um, so at the top of G17, it says, as part of the development of the green network, all rivers and streams will be protected and enhanced for the benefit of wildlife and where appropriate for public access and recreation and this will be done by and then there are four things listed i believe um, your planning officer has mentioned c appears to be the most appropriate here uh, where that states um it be expecting the setting back of new development to an appropriate distance from the banks of major rivers and streams to allow for landscaping uh, but just there, I don't know whether, I don't think the planning office had the opportunity to know what the, the, it says in definitions in respect of appropriate distance, which is referred to in C. An appropriate distance is stated as eight metres in the case of major rivers and streams, unless this would seriously harm the operations of an existing commercial or industrial development, or make a site undevelopable, or where a harder, more urban effect is needed for townscape reasons. Uh, I just thought that would be useful just to add that of extra context in respect to what appropriate distance is there and um, thank you chair okay right councillor masters thank you chair there's a few things i wanted to raise if that's okay mm -hmm. one go i mean first of all you mentioned at the start there was a one meter passageway between the existing building and the proposed building what's the what how is that going to be used because it's quite a it's going to be a tunnel isn't it effect and that lends itself to all sorts of sort of antisocial behaviour and, and dangers, as well as collecting litter and all the rest of it. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, going back to the bins, I mean, I'm a bit concerned, if you like, that the conversations you seem to have had with the, uh, the, the developers have been a bit unsympathetic to what we, as a council, actually would like to see going forward in the future in the city. Um, but. You say it's a timber enclosure, it's got a roof. I mean, is there any possibility of having sort of a green roof to it? Because timber will support it. That is a nod only to improving the biodiversity of the site. Um, 
uh, again, going back to discussions we've just had, and um, sort of, you know, considering the cons conversations you've had up till date, because you know them better than we do, would there be anything to be gained by deferring the application so that the developer can actually take note of our genuine concerns about the way this development, it's not the commercial side we're concerned about, it's the sort of, it's the environmental side of it, and it's enhancing that site so that for the future, would there be anything gained if we actually uh, propose to defer that? Uh, or would they have to come back with a new application, completely different, and therefore we could not judge? I mean, basically, it's what judgment do we take? Have we got to take a judgment on what is there now? If we defer it, is it still a case of taking a judgment on what is there now? Or is there scope for them to actually improve things slightly to satisfy just some of these concerns that we have? Thank you. Uh, Chair, uh, so the first point was on the, the I, I said approximate one metre gap. I've just uh, looked again at the drone. It's 1.1 metre, so it was about right. Um, there is a gate, actually, a, a security measure at either end. Um, to prevent access is purely for maintenance. That, that's what that's there for. So that, that should, uh, antisocial behaviour, etc., shouldn't be an issue. Neither should litter, particularly. Um, in terms of the bin storage, it's a timber uh, slatted housing as opposed to a building, and it doesn't actually have a roof at the moment. So it would be, it would be. In fact, I think I had an image earlier. Uh, yes. Um, so. Uh, Unless I'm mistaken, it doesn't have a lid at the moment, so it it, it would have to be redesigned quite significantly to incorporate uh, a green roof. Um, but as a general principle, there's no reason why housings of that nature couldn't incorporate a green roof. Um, you can buy bin stores, bike stores with green roofs um, uh, in all sorts of places. Um, so that that is that is possible. Um, in terms of anything to be gained from deferral, what would happen with the deferral is uh, it would be deferred for a particular action uh, to take place uh, uh, with members in, instructing officers as to what that action should be. Uh, and it would then be returned back to committee uh, at a later date. Um, it wouldn't be a fresh application. That would only occur in, in, um, in an eventuality where uh, a different decision was reached and, and the recommendation wasn't supported and in other words the application was refused and um, uh, the applicant had to return. That's the only situation where you would get a, a, a fresh application around those matters. Um, yes, um, y yesterday we reviewed, uh, we did site visits for everything Apart from this uh, this particular one, I was very disappointed to be to be frank because e even looking at um, these diagrams and all the explanations, you you just don't get the exact feel for the um, for the site as you would if you were actually present. I mean, you know, it's, it's talked about the widening access. Well, we don't know what it looks like. We we. we uh, there is one person here who has uh, experienced it. Um, I, the, th the thing is, it, there is a dichotomy here because we, we, we want the commercial side of the business to, uh, to succeed, but there's also the, the, uh, um, the environmental side that uh, we're all concerned about. And Sheffield uh, doesn't have a navigable river unlike some big towns. And so what, what these people are doing all these groups are doing are trying to enhance what we have got. And these are small, small rivers, but nevertheless, um, they can be made to be uh, attractive. Now, I don't know what that walkway looks like, to be, to be frank, and uh, I'm a, a little uh, puzzled as to why we, we, didn't, we didn't look at it. Um, I, if we had a deferral, you say it has to be for a, a, um, a question or a point that we, we, we're making. Well, the, the question that I have really is um, um, whether or not what we've seen with uh, the layout is, is um, uh, if it's possible 
to change that layout without uh, uh, being detrimental to that business. Why anybody wants to sit around uh, where there are cars constantly going through, I don't know. But, I mean, that's their choice. But I think we ought to look at the um, uh, 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 at this side of things. Um, uh, what, what, is the, what is the problem of, um, uh, of not, not just deferring it so that we can have a, uh, another look at the, or, or a look at it, because we didn't get a chance uh, uh, yesterday. Chair, I, I think that was a request. I'm not putting words in yeah. Councillor Davidson's mouth, but I think that was a request to defer for a site visit. Chair, um, just to, um, yes, obviously you can uh, defer for a site visit and that is provided for in, in the constitution. Um, typically when a defer for a site visit is suggested, I would normally ask the planning officer to comment on whether he thinks a site visit um, is, is worthwhile. Um, obviously, I don't know whether Chris wants to provide that. Obviously, in this instance, we do have a lot of photographs showing the sites. Um, I don't know what members think they'll be able to gain on site as opposed to what's provided on the photographs, but obviously Chris can comment um, further from that matter. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I, I, given the comments that have been made, uh, I, and, and clearly members are uncertain about uh, or unsatisfied with some of the responses, uh, then I think a, a visit would be worthwhile, uh, both to view the relationship with the site to the river, uh, there are quite a few photographs of that here, but uh, the relationship of the site with the river and also the access um, that the members are, are concerned about. So I would have no objection to, to that. Chair, can I just ask, if, if we are deferring it, then could it also be an opportunity for the developer to come back to the planning officers to see what measures could be incorporated in this to address some of our concerns? Would that be allowed, Victor? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, if uh, somebody wants to propose a deferral for a site visit and for the um, planning officer to contact the developer to discuss the concerns and, and then to come back, that was actually proposed, second, and then voted on. Thank you, Chair. You're proposing, Barbara, to defer? Motion, I'll second, Chair. Thanks. Right, so come in. We'll take a vote on that. Do you want to? Can I still have, have an opportunity for making comments if we vote to defer? No. Uh, Chair, just on respect of comment, obviously, um, as I mentioned earlier, the process is we discuss the application, we get all the information, then you make comments on the way that you, you feel about the application. You shouldn't have determined how you feel about the application until you've obtained all the information and, and in this case it would appear that members may be deciding that site visit will form part of that so it wouldn't be uh, reasonable for any member to uh, make a comment on, on what they think about this application at this point because it, it, it may be deferred for a further meeting at which point once that discussion's happened you'd be able to then make up your mind. Thank you Chair. Could I uh, be able to ask some questions then? Chair, at this point, I believe uh, we've got a motion on the floor that's been proposed on second. So I think the, the common thing to do here would, would be to, um, to take a vote on that. Um, obviously, it, it's at your discretion at this point, Chair, whether you want to take any further questions on, on other matters. Um, but obviously, typically what we've done previously, Chair, is where we've deferred for a specific issue. When we come back, we only discuss um, things relevant to the reason for, of deferral. So it, it's whether you want to try and uh, get members to discuss any other items outside of the reason, potential reasons for deferral. In this instance, it does seem that one of the reasons for deferral is for the um, developer and planning officers to further discuss you know, some quite substantial issues. So in this instance, you know, it, it may be worthwhile just deferring at this point and having a wider discussion next time. Thank you, Chair. And on that, Chair, as well, just, just going back from that, I think we need to have a, um, another report back as well, if, you, if it does get passed, to about highways, just have another second look at that. Um, Chair, at, at this moment, um, I believe you've got a, a proposal on the floor, which is for a defer for a site visit and for the planning officer um, to discuss with developers some of the concerns that have already been raised. Um, one of the concerns that has been raised is about highway safety, so that is something that the planning officer could take forward with it with the uh, applicant at, at this moment. 
Um, it's, but obviously it's up to you, Chair, who will take that forward. Can we just go forward and take a vote on the deferment first, please? Okay. So, so raise hands for deferment. Yeah, unanimous then. So we move on. So we move on now. Okay, so we move on. We're deferring it. Does it make a question that's nothing to do with that? I just want to know the re the position where, where KFC fit into this or the side of it. And I, I don't quite explain it in the in, in actual presentation we've got here. It, it, they own it, yes. and it's a car park at the moment, and the bins are there. Are the bins the KFC car park? They belong to the KFC. Yes. yes. So it's a, it's a KFC bins we're talking about. Not, not, so what's being built? Is it KFC who's building this <laughs> restaurant? Or that's separate, is it? Like a subsidiary of KFC. Uh, how, do the old, how does the jigsaw fit together? Uh, Chair, the bins that we were talking about are the bins for uh, the um, Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> unit. Sure, there's some on that picture, that's all. There's some already there. That's there are, there. yeah, they would be relocated as part of, um, a part of that, which we should have been on the layout. Um, I'll. I'll We'll confirm all that back at the next when it returns, Chair. Foot break for everybody. Okay. So back at four o'clock. All back now. Ready to resume? Good. Right, so we move on to our final application, item 7D, planning application 22 oblique 02691, which is 51 to 57 High Street. Okay, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this application is for a 40-storey co-living residential tower um, on High Street. This slide shows the red line boundary of the site. Um, the red line boundary includes King Street to the north of the site um, because some landscape improvements are proposed to the public realm in that area. Uh, the site is located um, with uh, High Street to the south, Angel Street to the west, and King Street to the north. The aerial image shows the site, um, and you can see the proximity to the Castle Square tram stop, which is located to the southwest of the site. This image is taken from um, the junction of Angel Street and High Street, to the west of the site. Um, the building uh, relates to the angled building towards the front of the site. That's proposed to be demolished, and the 40-storey tower is proposed to be built on that part of the site. Uh, but the, the development also includes the lower floors of the Easy Hotel, which is located just behind the angle building. Um, you can see that the roof height drops down slightly, and there's an orange sign which relates to the site, which is currently used as a hotel. Um, and it's proposed to use the basement, the ground floor, the first floor, and a small part of the second floor in conjunction with the co-living residential tower. This is another slide taken uh, um, from the west of the site. Um, you can see High Street to the right of the image and King Street to the left of the image. Uh, again, another image taken from Angel Street uh, with a view towards King Street, which is to the north of the site. This is taken from Angel Street looking down King Street. Um, this is the basement floor plan of the proposal. Uh, so you can see to the left-hand side of the image, uh, that's the basement area of the tower, and that includes plant and bin stores. Uh, and then to the right hand of the screen in green is the basement of the existing building to be retained. And that's proposed to be used as a gym um, in conjunction with the co-living accommodation. This is a ground floor plan. Uh, the area in blue is the main entrance uh, and lobby to the co-living tower. And the area directly um, above that is a class E commercial unit. Within the retained portion of the building, um, fronting King Street is another class E unit. And 
to the south of the building fronting High Street is a um, co-working space to be used in association with co-living accommodation. Uh, this floor plan relates to the mezzanine of the tower and the first floor of the uh, existing hotel unit. Um, the existing hotel at the first floor and a part of the second floor is to be used as studio accommodation in association with the co-living uh, development. And within the tower portion of the building, there's a um, cluster unit there. Uh, taking a typical floor plan, um, you can see that the accommodation is um, provided in these sort of cluster units. So the blue um, areas are individual studio accommodation and they include a bedroom, an ensuite room and a small sort of kitchen area and living area. Um, and they have access to the pinky coloured area, which is a communal, um, a communal kitchen, living and dining area. So typically the uh, accommodation is um, arranged around these clusters of uh, five and six bed clusters. Uh, there is also one 10 bed cluster, one seven bed cluster and one four bed cluster, but this is the typical arrangement. Um, just to go back to that, sorry. Um, whilst we're on this slide, it's worth talking about the uh, sort of accommodation that's proposed. So th this is co-living. Um, which is a fairly new concept and it essentially provides individual accommodation so in the studios in the blue areas um, and so they're fairly small studios but they're supported by um, adjacent communal facilities um, they're managed by a single provider um, and the product is targeted at the graduate market consultancy type workers who only need to be in a particular location for a few months key workers um, and also recent incomers to the city who might not necessarily want to rent on their own but might not know anyone with whom they would be able to share. Uh, occupancy isn't restricted to any particular groups such as uh, students or graduates or key workers but would be available for anybody to live in. So this is an image of the tower taken from King Street to the north of the site. Uh, you can see that it's linked to the existing uh, hotel building uh, and this, uh, this facade of the building is um, brick with glazed openings as you can see there. This is a view taken looking up High Street um, from the direction of Ponds Forge. Uh, you can see if you look on the right hand side of the tower that's the brick element is sort of wrapped around to, to this facade. There's a glazed link in the middle which is recessed and then the left hand side of the tower is um, a concrete bridge structure with uh, large glazing elements in between. This is taken from the south looking from High Street so sort of from Castle sort of Square area and this uh, facade is the concrete uh, bridge structure with the glazed elements um, expressed. It's a, got a curved um, corner um, which sort of wraps around onto Angel Street. And this is taken looking from the west of the site, uh, sort of down High Street. Uh, and again, you can see the, the junction of the two buildings. So there's the brick element and the glazed element and how they, they meet there in the middle. Um, the proposal is for a contemporary tall building. Um, it's obviously tall and it will provide a landmark feature which will be visible not only from the surrounding area, but also the city skyline from views um, into the city centre. This site is considered to be an appropriate location <coughs> for a tall building, <coughs> excuse me, uh, given that it's on a corner location, it's on a key transport node where there's um, the tram stop and bus stops, and it will be visible in views along High Street and Arundel Street, serving as a marker within the Castlegate area. The site is opposite the conservation area, the city centre conservation area, and there are a number of listed buildings near to the site. Uh, however, the proposal is not considered to detract from these heritage assets. Attention is also drawn to the fact that we've granted a 39-storey tower in 2020. This proposal is six metres taller. Um, the external treatment in terms of materiality, um, footprint and form is very is very similar to that which was previously approved, with the key difference being the extra six 
metre increase in height. So the principle of a tall building has been established in this location. Um, just go back and talk about um, sort of co-living and amenity. So I'll bring up the slide which shows the living accommodation. Um, so in terms of policy, the proposal will support the regeneration of the Castlegate area, um, which is supported by policy, and it will also um, support the aims of providing increased city centre living. Core strategy policy CS41 seeks to create mixed communities. Co-living is not mentioned specifically in that policy, and this proposal will be wholly for co-living, but predominantly in five and six bed clusters. Um, but it's highlighted that co-living is not restricted to any particular group and will be open to anybody who chooses to live there. This will provide a new form of accommodation in the Castlegate area. There's no other co-living schemes within that area. Um, and officers don't consider that it would be harmful to any established residential community within that area. It will create high density of living um, and an efficient use of land. Um, and it supports the city centre strategic vision of promoting Castlegate as a gateway location and a high density mixed use area. In terms of amenity, the studios are small. Um, in terms of space standards, although Sheffield hasn't adopted the nationally described space standards, um, the studios wouldn't meet the standards when viewed individually. However, if you combine the size of the studios with the communal living accommodation provided for each cluster, um, and if you um, combine the floor spaces, the resultant spaces would be in excess of similar five or six bed um, standards in the nationally described space standards. So for, for example, if it's the six bed sizes set out in the space standards, um, these are in excess of those standards when viewed as a whole. Um, the sort of small nature of the clusters will promote um, will promote the co-living model. So it will, will create sort of that intimate um, feeling where people know their neighbors and they know each other um, and they can go into the communal areas and, and, and form that co-living relationship. Um, in terms of daylight and sunlight, there will be some impact um, from the tower, but because it's so slender, um, the impacts will be transient um, and largely similar to the previous scheme, given that the scale is, is very similar. Um, in terms of wind impact, uh, the proposal um, will require some mitigation measures to be implemented to ensure that there isn't an adverse impact on the local microclimate. So there's things like canopies um, on the building which will stop the wind flowing down um, and some mitigation within the street in terms of um, st structures in the street such as tree planting which will, which will ensure that there's a comfortable environment. Um, there's no car parking provided with the building but there is cycle parking and the site's in a very sustainable location. Uh, a £75,000 contribution will be provided to improve the tram stop at Castle Square. Uh, at present, there is a market uh, King, on King Street, um, and that's a, um, a day market where traders just come, uh, they turn up on the day and they can set up, um, provided they've got a, a trading licence. Um, that will need to be relocated um, during construction works. And we have previously granted a temporary permission for a temporary relocation on Esperanto Place, just off Arundel Gate, to ensure that that market can continue um, during construction works. And then uh, there is a condition which requires an area to be provided for that market to be able to relocate back there when uh, this development has um, been completed. Um, so in summary, um, and given the tilted balance is in play and there's no considered to be no significant adverse effects from the proposal. The officer recommendation is for approval, subject to a, a legal agreement to secure the funds towards the uh, tram stop improvements. Um, I'll just draw attention to the supplementary report. Um, there has been one additional representation, um, which is an objection. So um, the officer report already details the seven objections received and the council objection received um, and the additional representation is summarised um, 
in the supplementary report. Uh, there's also been um, a recommendation to change uh, one of the conditions. So one of the conditions requires the um, additional amenity space provided, such as the co-working space in the gym, to be um, available at all times for people living in the co-scheme. And there's just a slight tweak to the wording there to ensure that um, it's the accommodation is provided as part of the tenancy agreement, so i.e. people don't have to um, pay additional fees for use of any of these additional community spaces. Um, and an additional condition is suggested um, which would ensure that there would be a minimum tenancy period of three months um, to assist in the creation of communities and avoid any concerns in relation to a high turnover of residents or potential use as short-term um, accommodation or holiday type lets. There's also um, an update in relation to the new MPPF um, and again the key uh, change there is that we now need a four-year housing land supply instead of a five-year housing land supply um, and that the current um, figure is two, a 2.7 one-year supply so we still don't have that uh, land, housing land supply. Uh, but the overall implications of the changes um, are limited and don't affect the assessment um, as set out in the officer report. Um, and there's also some reference to the old paragraph numbers and, and what the new paragraph numbers are going forward. So. Thank you, Chair. have one speaker on this. Could I ask Mr. Matthew Sobrin? Have I said your surname correctly? Uh, yes, <laughs> Okay, fine. With my Yorkshire accent, that's fine then. Okay. Right. You have, uh, if you want to put the light on, then you have five minutes. Thank you. Um, Chair, members, thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak in relation to the application for a new development comprising residential and commercial uses on the corner of Angel Street and the High Street in the city centre. I'm conscious we're at the end of the agenda and members will be familiar with the site and proposal from yesterday's site visit and also the, the officer's report which has been comprehensively been covered by Sarah Hall just then. So what I'll try and do is I'll try and keep things brief. The proposal is in effect a revision to an earlier application that was supported by the City Council and approved just over three years ago as referenced by Mrs Hull. The application site has been vacant for over seven years since Primark closed its doors and relocated to the mall. It is in an area of the city that has been long earmarked for regeneration and this was most recently evidenced by the previous permission granted by the Council for a 39 storey building. As referenced um, moments ago, this proposal is only six additional metres above and in effect one storey larger than the, the building already granted permission. The site also falls within an area of the city that is undergoing investment by the council, including prints being undertaken to Fargate and the High Street under the Future High Street Fund initiative, and the council's own green to, uh, sorry, grey to green initiative around Castlegate. The site and the wider area that it is situated in is earmarked for regeneration and increasing residential provision within the city centre in both the council's central area strategy and its strategic vision report for the city centre. A further point is that the site is allocated for redevelopment for high density residential uses in the City Council's emerging local plan. We therefore consider that the site presents an opportunity to deliver new residential uses at scale with new active commercial frontages at ground floor level to revitalise the site and contribute positively to the regeneration of the Castlegate area in line with the established strategic aspirations of the aforementioned Council documents and in a way that complements the wider scheme of investment that the Council is undertaking. We consider the proposal is therefore positive private sector investment that will complement the council's own investment in the area. As also referenced a moment ago, the site is located at the edge of the Castlegate area and in a prominent location along the Keys to West High Street Commercial Street Corridor and the North to South Corridor along Arundel Gate. The redevelopment of the site provides a gateway opportunity for a statement market building for the city centre in urban design terms and the building has been designed in this way by award-winning architect of practice, Hodder and Partners, to deliver a high-quality landmark building in the same way that the previous approved planning permission would have done. The proposal will deliver well-designed public realm that will substantially improve the existing public realm in the area 
tying in both with the council's initiatives in the castle gate and far gate areas of the city. The proposed residential uses are well located for residents to be able to benefit from utilizing sustainable and active modes of travel, including public transport and pedestrian and cycling infrastructure. The new residents will have easy access to surrounding employment opportunities and services, and the new population will also have direct access to retail, leisure and commercial services. And the use of those services by residents of the development will benefit those businesses in the local economy. The proposal has been assessed in considerable detail by the Council's officers and technical consultees as part of both a comprehensive pre-application process and the formal application process that's been undertaken subject to this application. It's concluded by your officers and consultees that all matters are confirmed to be agreed in relation to development management, conservation and sustainability considerations in order for a viable development to be delivered. We'd like to thank officers of the council for their collaborative approach in supporting the delivery of this landmark development in the city centre, which accords with local and national policies. And we therefore kindly request that members approve the application in line with that officer recommendation. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Sorry you've had to sit through all, all the previous applications. So <laughs> it's, always, it's always an interesting segue into the day job, so don't, <laughs> don't worry about that. I don't think I need to respond on that one, okay. Chair. Any questions? Right, Councillor Davison. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I did go and see this. It's a, a remarkable uh, project and uh, not unlike the leaning tower of Pisa, but I hope it remains in a perpendicular uh, uh, position uh, for its lifetime. But the question I'm going to ask is a rather strange one on item 13 here. Sheffield, should uh, Doncaster Sheffield Airport reopen, the applicant is advised that any high reach access equipment or 5G communication mass must have the airport's prior permission. Are we intending to fly uh, aeroplanes over, just over that little bit? Uh, how high is it going to be? And uh, why do I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'll leave you there. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes, uh, I believe that the airport commented on the proposal and just suggested that that was um, something that should be taken into consideration uh, and put on as a directive um, so that's the reason that that was put on there um, I can't answer the questions about whether the airport will reopen or whether the, where the flight paths will be or that kind of thing um, unfortunately I think the flight path could just about manage to get past that uh, that particular obstacle um, but how high will it be in total uh, with a 5G um, uh, enhancement? Well, I, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. So um, I, it would depend on what was proposed to be put on there, if at any point 5G was proposed to be on there. Um, I just, I, and I don't have that information, I'm afraid. Councillor Price. Can you just clarify, is the, the hotel staying there, the CNA building, is that going to be rain <laughs> open while the building is inside of it? Um, the building is to be retained um, and part, part of the hotel accommodation is to be, provide, to be retained as well. I would imagine it would need to close at some point whilst the internal works were ongoing. Um, but if I just go back to the floor plan, so that's so so basement ground floor and first floor will be used in association with this building and then this is the second floor so you can see there the the darker black line indicates where the hotel accommodation is to be retained on on the right of the screen and then there's just those four studios and then i believe there's another floor above that um, and the entrance will will retain be retained as well but yeah how that works in practice i'm driving b and Councillor Chaplin. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose, ad, adding on to, to Roger's question, what is the actual height of this building? We know it's 40 storeys, but we don't know what that translates into, into metres. I have a second question. <coughs> um, page 106, um, fourth paragraph down, uh, second sentence, 
um, the development would be in close proximity to various public spaces in and around the city centre, i.e. cathedral approximately 3M walk. And we get other Peace Garden 6M walk, um, South Street Park 7M walk. What, what does, that doesn't mean anything to me um, unless, unless there's been some, some typos there. Um, and the other, another question is on the, the wind um, <coughs> category. Um, as a layperson, I do not understand what <coughs> wind, wind what, what wind categories are about, but I can tell you when it's a windy day. Um, so that, that relates to paragraph near the top on page 110. Um, where it, it talks about um, the report notes that these measures would be <coughs> one surrounding building at surrounding building entrance which would be one category windier than desired wind conditions in terms of comfort it's, there seems to be a recognition there that it, it there is going to be something of a wind tunnel effect around this building thank you Right, so I'll try and take those in turn. Um, so in terms of the height, um, it's 40 storeys high. I don't have the actual height in metres um, available, but as mentioned earlier, it is six metres higher than what we have proved previously. Um, but I haven't measured the actual overall height. Um, in terms of the reference you made to 3M and 6M, that, that means minutes, so it's like a three-minute walk to... I can't remember where it was a three minute walk to and six minute walk to the Peace Gardens, etc. etc. Um, in terms of wind, um, when a wind assessment is carried out, they uh, attribute ca categories to different areas, um, and um, there's a range of categories, uh, so, um, ranging from sort of not very windy at all to, to uh, ultimately unsafe uh, wind impacts. Um, although um, this does state that the um, category around one of the entrances of the building nearby will be one category higher than desirable. Um, it's not unsafe, and um, so it doesn't reach the unsafe ca category. So whilst ideally it will be slightly less windy, it's not going to be unsafe for people. And again, um, it's highlighted that we have granted this um, building at this scale already, and the impact of an additional six metres on the wind environment is not likely to have much of an impact at all in comparison to what we've previously granted. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I did miss one, one more, um, and that was on page 111, Yorkshire Water objecting to the proposed tree planting. Um, the tree planting, I imagine, would be part of extending grey to green, which generally we welcome, and extending it down King Street. Um, but Yorkshire Water are very concerned that uh, tree roots, as they um, <coughs> get older, can disrupt um, <coughs> disrupt water pipes there. Yeah. Well, so would yeah. Would that be a material consideration? So, so you're correct that there, there is that concern from Yorkshire Water, but we have addressed that through conditions. So there's a condition uh, which states that. Uh, the tree shall not be planted within five metres of the sewer. Um, and there's also a condition requiring details of the hard and soft landscape scheme. So we'll be able to secure the tree planting uh, just in the right place. And the street is wide enough to be able to allow that. Any more questions? Councillor Masters. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's a lot of mention about sort of, you know, sort of making it a sustainable building. And... Uh, but there's a lot of glass in there and we know now it's not just sort of uh, basically sort of you, you could actually have sort of the sun's rays bouncing off and heating the pavement considerably but I'm also thinking um, concerned about the impact inside the building where they overheat so this must have been um, featured in different uh, developments is there a specification for the glass used to make sure the building doesn't overheat in summer Thank you. That's not something that we would consider as part of planning, whether that would be covered under building regulations is a separate matter, really. Um, we have 
in terms of sustainability, there is a condition about renewable, uh, renewable energy and, and um, uh, there's a, an energy statement being provided. But um, I don't believe that overheating is being considered specifically, but it, it would be considered as part of building regs. Yeah, I was also thinking in terms of the fact that you, they have to provide, you know, the materials they're going to use. And I just wondered whether, because they have to, I presume they have to, um, specify the kind of glass they're going to use, whether that was planning, and you're saying no, it isn't, it's building. No, we wouldn't We wouldn't consider what kind of glass they were going to use as part of the planning process. Thank you, Chair. Uh, really, a couple of questions about the previous application, because I think it, it bears a lot of weight on whether we go with this or not. Um, the 39-storey block, was that more traditional apartments rather than the, uh, the co I don't know, cohabiting style of this one. Sure. And, sorry? Co-living. 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 Well, you never know. Yeah, um, could be, yeah. the, the, Sarah talked about getting on, all of them getting on. Um, and the second one, was there any car parking in the, the previous application? Thank you for that. Uh, so, yes, the previous application was uh, C3 residential apartments. It was a mixture of studios, one bed and two bed apartments. I think there were 206 of them in total. Um, and there was no parking on that one either. It's a quite a constrained site and there's not really any space to provide parking. So really the relationship between the, the current application and the previous one, they're quite different really. So, um, they're, they're, they're both very tall, but I actually think it's a number of people living in the build in this potential building is, a, is quite a major factor. Thank you. Councillor Hartage. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, in, in terms of the national space standards, you said that when the communal areas are added onto the size of the studios, which are indeed quite small, then they exceed the space requirements. Is that when you add the total area of the communal area onto each um, pseudo or just a fraction of it? Uh, I think I understand the question, but let me answer it and then you can tell me if I've understood it correctly. So that's looking at each cluster unit and its individual shared accommodation. So not taking into account any of the shared accommodation at ground level. Is that, is that what you, yeah, okay. I mean, it, so, so, say you've got 10 studios in a cluster. Have you added one tenth of the communal area for that cluster in order to get to the point where you exceed the national space requirement? Or have you added the total area of the communal area to each studio? Does that make sense? I think, I think so. So we've added, so say we've added all of it together as one. So the communal space for each cluster, plus all the clusters together, and come up with a combined total for that area. Um, and they are on there, but I can't read them, because um, it's too far away. Um, and then compared that with, say, so say it was at six studios, we've compared, compared that with a six bed house, rather than looking at them individually. successful co-living that we've got elsewhere in Sheffield really sort of hinges on the fact that everyone's on the same page and they're all quite like-minded people that are using those shared areas. Um, otherwise you end up in a situation that's like a lot of student accommodation where some people don't have effective use of the shared area because they're not um, as dominant personalities and some people have overuse of it and there's also going to be a lot of management involved. The responsibility for making sure that it's all clean looked after people put their stuff away where does that fall we have asked for details of a management um plan so let me just find the correct condition for that bear with me a second So, yeah, condition 28, um, it states, the, re uh, the residential portion of the development shall not be occupied unless a detailed building management plan has been submitted to and approved in writing 
by the LPA, the management plan shall demonstrate how the co-living use hereby approved and all associated amenity areas, including gym and co-working space, will operate and be managed. Uh, thereafter, the management of the building shall only be undertaken in full accordance with the approved management plan. So we have asked for details of that. Um, it almost feels like to that extent of, you know, who's going to put the pots away and who's going to manage it, 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 that feels like a step perhaps beyond what we would control and no different to perhaps a normal household or, you know, how people in a, fl a flat would, would live together as opposed to perhaps a building management issue. So if this um, had gone to any of the closest possible classifications for this building so that it wasn't a sui generis um, application, would those be C3 or purpose-built student? And it would have fallen against either of those because of um, over-demand, is that correct? <coughs> or oversupply? Can you repeat that question, please? Um, so because of the co-living element of this scheme, it moved out of existing classifications within the NPPF and into a sui generis category. If it hadn't been, if it had been classified as either C3 student apartments or designated student accommodation, PBSA, would it have been denied because of a current oversupply? We would have had to look at that in a little bit more detail. There is some reference in the report which does raise concerns that if it was uh, PBSA or just purely studio accommodation. I think it does state in the report that we would potentially have concerns about it. Uh, but that isn't what we're looking at. We're looking at this as a co-living and, and on the merits of the scheme we've got in front of us today. Thanks, Sarah. I'm slightly concerned that 40 storeys of bed sits is an unproven concept and it's a very big building and it's also a very big risk um, for the council as well as sort of reputation because it is going to dominate the skyline. I, I'm not sure that that was a question, really. No, it wasn't a question, OK. Uh, sorry, I, I did miss this one out. On page 107, you talk about the, uh, the, uh, the fumes and um, uh, other uh, smells that, uh, that uh, uh, do in, invade uh, uh, these areas. What it doesn't mention, though, is that uh, the people themselves will be cooking perhaps even at the same time. What, uh, so is, what, what's the facilities for extraction for, for each of those individual uh, kitchens, which will all be producing their own unique um, odours and smells? Uh, yeah, the, the report, as you mentioned, uh, refers to commercial food, which obviously creates a greater uh, level of, sort of odour and fume, but the cooking facilities would just be sort of a standard residential cooking facilities like you would find in any um, block of flats. Um, so there's no particular need for us to control. Oh, oh yes, there is. You go in any block of flats and sometimes the odours from the different cooking are very, uh, very smellable in the, um, in, uh, outside each, each of the, uh, the blocks, each of the houses or, you know, the... Um, apartments. Okay, yeah, and that may well be the case, but it's not something that we would really get involved in from a planning point of view. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, it's no similar to any of the other residential accommodation which we've granted in, in blocks within the city centre. This is a large uh, block, uh, and it's, it's got 400 people that could all be cooking at the same time. So it's, it's, it is an untried uh, situation that we're, we're looking at here and so there the would be um, uh, some some problems with with fumes uh, 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 and odors of different uh, varieties how would you get how, you, you, there must be some way that we can look at this if we're looking at it from external uh, situations like the, the cafes and so on why don't we look at the internal ones because that could cause problems for people that are living in those places if they're not uh, adequately um, uh, dispersed, you know, if the smells and odours are not adequately dispersed. Victoria, you want to Chair, talk? thank you. Um, as the planning officer has already said, this isn't something that um, we're concerned with in terms of the planning remit, but I think it may be useful. My understanding is that building regs um, will 
well um, detail extraction where cooking facilities are provided in, in a residential um, in a residential place. Uh, just in terms of commercial and why we look at it there, obviously in terms of commercial, it's obviously going to be cooking, you know, on a much more intensive basis where there's more likelihood to be a uh, disimmunity to nearby residents. And of course, um, extraction on a larger scale typically it will involve or could involve some external um, equipment which may have uh, an impact on, on um, visibility and immunity in that respect. So that's why there's a difference there with commercial and residential uses. But as I say, in this instance, my understanding is that building regs will be taking interest in the correct amount of extraction for the cooking being proposed. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Really following up for uh, the route that Henry was going down, um, if this doesn't work, is there a plan B? And I know that might not necessarily be a planning point, but I think in some respects it should be because um, it's a huge, it could potentially be a huge, great, I won't use the phrase, but um, mistake if we're not careful and I'm sure uh, the gentleman there is probably I'm sure they would have thought of this um, thank you uh, we have had some plans uh, we have they have the developer has submitted some plans demonstrating how the units could be converted to one bed or two bed units which would meet the nationally described space standards so yeah if it, if it doesn't work um, I'm sure they wouldn't want their building to sit empty and there would be the potential for it to be changed into C3 residential accommodation subject to um, permission as well because there are a few conditions which would restrict that as well okay councillor price yes uh First of all, I support the recommendation, Chair. I think it's a good, it meets lots of our objectives. First of all, it's going to provide some decent footfall to the city centre to help all, all the retailers. I'm sure they'll rub their hands with glee when they see this footfall being plonked on the doorstep. The, um, it's clear that uh, it, it's not untried, by the way. There's many cities, have, uh, uh, well, there's other cities that have buildings as tall as this, and, and I, I assume that they've, they've sorted out any problem of films from different flats in this day and age. Um, and the other thing is, of course, it helps us to meet this dilemma we have of trying to provide 30,000 new homes in this city. And unless we build upwards, we're going to be going on more green spaces and, and, and the green belt. And, and this type of venture is a, is a, is a, is a way forward, build upwards. And um, it's clear to me over the last decade there's been a growth in popularity in city centre living. I mean, it doesn't suit me, but it's clearly, it's not just students, this. There's, there's many people I know now who, who love the city centre, love living in the city centre, and it's growing popularity. So I think it meets many objectives, um, particularly the one about having to find land for more and more homes. Uh, it can't be many more brownfield sites you can build on, so we're going to have to be going on to greenfield sites and, and the green belt. So this, uh, this I'd option of building upwards is, to me is, a, is, is a, one of the solutions but we're not going mad but I think this is a, a great exciting project and I'm going to support it chair. Councillor Masters. Thank you chair I mean apart from the fact that it's so tall I actually think it addresses a need in the city where you've got people moving in for a short time and it will sort of uh, release accommodation for as it's specified, key workers, people on short-term contracts coming in. So on that basis, uh, I'll support it. Councillor McGrath. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, Peter reminded me then of, you know, uh, a few years ago where you know, we were saying about building more, more building, you know, and everything else. And, I can remember, I think I read a Tory on TV uh, earlier today saying that no detached houses should be built. You know what I mean? They, they should be, they should be other types of houses built and not, not no detached, so you shouldn't be wanting to live in that accommodation. Uh, it's all right, I'm not bothered about the height of the building. You know, what concerns me is the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the room size, you know, and the communal size. So that, that worries me. And also there's been no artwork uh, the building at the side, uh, Castle House, is it? Yeah. That's got a lovely 
structure on the side of the building. It's a nice piece of artwork, what sets that, that and this is a lovely corner, lovely, lovely building what they're going to be building. It would be nice to have a, a nice piece of artwork on here. That's just my comment, Chair. Thank you. Don't know if we'll get Banksy up that high, but there we go. Councillor Nottage. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I've got absolutely no objection to building up and in increasing the density of accommodation. I'm also a big fan of the council's wider plans to create stronger, um, more embedded communities in the city centre. I do, however, have a lot of concerns about the very small size of the units. I was concerned that the um, addition of the co-living space in order to change the classification was a bit of a fudge, and the fact that there are already plans on someone's desk to remove that co-living should it not work um, confirms that, and it should have been co put forward as a C3 uh, proposal so that it could have been properly examined as such. Um, and as such, I, I won't be supporting the recommendation. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Chair. Um, can I just ask the um, planning officer to comment on the comment about art? Because my understanding is there is a, a reference to a condition about public art on the site. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'll comment on both of those um, just to, to clarify a couple of points. But yes, there's a condition requiring public art on the site, so that will be considered as part of the um, going forward as discharge of conditions. Um, and in relation to um, the fact that we've seen plans uh, showing how the accommodation could be changed in the future, that was at our request because we wanted to be satisfied that uh, if the concept didn't work, that, that there would be an alternative solution rather than it you know, being proposed initially, if that makes sense. Okay, shall we go forward to a vote then, please? Can I just ask the Chair, before we go on, where's, where's, it, where's it mentioned the artwork in the paperwork? Chair, if you don't mind. Condition 27 requires details of the inclusion of public art. Sorry, that's page 75. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Williams. Apologies, very quick question. Is the current previous application still live? Was that lapsed? No, that lapsed in December 2023, so it's just lapsed. For the Office of Recommendations, Chair. For the Office of Recommendations, Chair. And again, Chair, for the application. For, sir. For the recommendation. For. Against the recommendation, Chair. Abstain, Chair. Uh, with reservations, I'm going to vote for it. For the application. Uh, I will abstain, Chair. Eight four, two abstains and one against. Right. So therefore, it is passed. Thank you. Right. Moving on to the next item on the agenda. Record of planning appeals, submissions, and decisions. Are there anything for us to note? Nothing to note, Chair. Unless you have any questions. Any questions from anyone? Okay. Can we just say then the next committee meeting will be on Tuesday the 5th of February at 2pm. Close the meeting.
Thank you.